from the 25,000 member Dream City Church in Phoenix, Pastor Luke Barnett joins us live on today's 700 Club. Welcome to the 700 Club. Tensions are building all over the world. We've got the possibility of a more regime change, which is needed in North Korea as they launch a missile capable of hitting as far as Denver and Los Angeles. We also have the Russians throwing out 755 American diplomats because of sanctions being placed upon them by the United States Congress. It looks like we're going to be in for a very hot fall and it won't be pleasant. We've got enemies on every side. But uh, at the White House, the first day on the job for President Trump's new chief of staff, Reince Priebus out, retired four-star General John Kelly in. He's been serving as the head of the Department of Homeland Security. Now he takes over to drain another swamp. And uh, can he stop the leaks? Well, with all of that happening, Kelly takes over as the administration is facing, as Pat mentioned, a deadlier nuclear threat from North Korea. And the president's trying to get the Senate to come up with a new health care plan. Jenna Browder brings us the story from Washington. It's a new chapter inside the White House as General John Kelly gets ready to become President Trump's new chief of staff. But with this new chapter comes a host of challenges, beginning with growing tensions overseas. Two. Congress has passed new passed. sanctions on Russia, and the White House says the president will sign them. Vladimir Putin retaliating over the weekend kind of with the expulsion of 755 kind of U.S. Too. diplomats, the largest force reduction for the U.S. in Moscow in more than 100 years. That comes amid growing tension with North Korea. Kim Jong-un launched his second intercontinental ballistic missile this month, saying his arsenal has the power to strike the United States mainland. This is here. They've been barking wolf about this. Well, the wolf is at the door. This is a very real threat to the United States. In response, a show of force from U.S. warplanes as they flew over the Korean peninsula. And President Trump is pointing the finger at China, tweeting, they do nothing for us with North Korea. We will no longer allow this to continue. The president wants China, which has more direct influence on the regime than any other country, to apply more diplomatic pressure. Back at the White House, Kelly is taking over an administration struggling with competing factions, disputes and leaks. Kelly has a reputation for discipline and he's tasked with bringing order to the West Wing. And there's also another push on health care from the president as he encourages the Senate to come up with a plan despite its failure to pass an Obamacare repeal bill last week. You can't promise folks you're going to do something for seven years and then not do it. That's why he, he keeps coming back to this and saying, look, Senate, do your job. Congress, do your job. Trump's presidency is only six months old, but already he's facing a huge list of challenges. And to add to that, there's the whole Russian probe. Now more than ever, he needs Kelly and the rest of his team to help him succeed. In Washington, Jenna Browder, CBN News. Thanks, Jenna. What do we do with North Korea? One thing we could do, if we launched an atmospheric low-yield nuke right over Pyongyang, uh, we could do to them the same thing an EMP would do to the United States. It would literally fry all of their communications throughout the entire country, and nothing would work. And we could shut them down instantly. But something has got to be done because those nukes are in the hands of a bunch of crazies. It isn't like uh, they're normal people like the Israelis who are, have got a, quite a war, a war chest, but they're not using it. But the, uh, or the Indians. But these people have threatened. They say this is for the U.S. and they've, they're aiming them at us. So it's time to do something. And somebody was suggesting, it was an article in the Wall Street Journal about a regime change. Well, that, that would be fine, but how do you do it? How do you manufacture regime change in a dictatorial country like North Korea? We don't know, but the time to act is now, N-O-W, now. Well, with us to talk about the challenges facing the Trump administration, CBN News National Security Correspondent Eric Rosales, and from the White House, political correspondent David Brody. Uh, David, uh, Trump wants 
Senate Republicans to try again on health care. Do you think that's wise? Or should they just let that thing go for a while? Well, look, Pat, uh, the, uh, the Republicans and, of course, the White House, they're all going to try, and try is in air quotes here, Pat. They're going to try and get something done on health care. But the truth of the matter is that train, at least for now, in the month of August, seems to be leaving the station. There is a top Senate source on Capitol Hill that just told me this morning that there seems to be some momentum for this bill by Lindsey Graham and Dean Heller and Bill Cassidy, all Republicans in the Senate, that in essence would take the taxes from Obamacare. In other words, those taxes would still stay in place. But taking the taxes and the money, the revenue from those taxes would then go to the states to come up with their own health care solution. The White House hasn't has said at all whether or not they would support something like that. But the point is, is that the source tells me that that type of bill is gaining momentum uh, in the Senate and possibly could be uh, up sometime in September after the August recess. Well, more important right now, it seems like to me, is tax reform. And uh, is the White House going to move on that anytime soon? Yeah, that's the plan. At least that's the plan internally here at the White House. In other words, they're going to talk, and especially on Twitter, you see a lot from the president about health care, health care, health care. The reality is that behind the scenes here at the White House, tax reform is topmost, uppermost in their minds. Because look, what, what sources here at the White House and on Capitol Hill are telling me, uh, Pat, is that tax reform must get done sometime by November. Why? Take six months to nine months to get that tax reform, whatever it happens to be, in place so the economy can start growing at an even more robust clip. And so I think that's the strategy right now, to get something done by November. It is a heavy lift. Having said that, Pat, uh, there are a lot of in the business community that are on board this time, along with the White House, so it seems like they have their act together more. Jim DeMint, as a matter of fact, was here. He's the former senator from South Carolina, used to be at the Heritage Foundation, and is still a major player here in Washington. He was meeting with senior top White House officials uh, just last week, late last week, about tax reform. So clearly there's a lot of movement here. Uh, there's some real bad blood between Scaramucci, Reince Priebus, who is out. Uh, Kelly is in. Uh, Kelly is a no-nonsense four-star Marine general. Do you think he can stop these leaks and bring the order to the staff of the White House? Well, that's the plan. It's kind of like Stratego here at the White House. The general is in charge, and there is a sense within the White House. As a matter of fact, the White House a source telling me this morning that he is objective, he being Kelly, is objective-oriented, leadership-oriented, and that's the crucial part of all of this, and that the final words from this White House source is, quote, he will be great. And there is a sense throughout all of the White House that they're looking forward to John Kelly coming in. He runs a tight ship. Remember, this is a man who lost his son in combat. His son, 29 years old in Afghanistan, stepped on a landmine. Uh, and so he, he knows all about the, the horrors of war, not just from a family perspective, but he's lived it for over 40 years. You know, David, I'm concerned about these uh, sanctions against Russia on the strength of uh, uh, the... Uh, fusion uh, reports that led to a special counsel. We're not really sure what the Russians have done in terms of uh, our voting, but it looks like we're punishing them regardless. Uh, is the special counsel going to be allowed to just keep roaming around and looking for a crime that hadn't yet been committed? Well, there is no doubt there is concern here at the White House about exactly that, Pat. However, a White House source uh, within the legal team realm here telling me that, look, if the special counsel goes down that road, they will take all appropriate measures to make sure that they do not go there. In other words, into the Trump family finances and all that, because there's no reason for that. That's a rabbit trail the way they see it. Uh, so they're going to fight fire with fire if that happens. And, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens. But I can tell you this. Uh, it's interesting if you connect the dots here. Think about this, Pat. You had James Comey, uh, who was, of course, let go by the president. But James Comey leaked, as, as he admits, he said he leaked uh, some of this information to get a special prosecutor involved. Well, guess what? That special prosecutor, as you know, Robert Mueller, a friend of James Comey. And then what does Robert Mueller do? Well, he hires a bunch of Clinton attorneys. So there are many conservatives, especially here at the White House, trying to connect the dots and saying, uh, folks, this is kind of a no-brainer. And that's why you hear the president all the time go on Twitter and say this is a political witch hunt. David, thank you so much. Keep it up. Well, our national security correspondent, Eric Rosales, is with us now from the Washington Bureau. And Eric, North Korea had a successful missile test over the 4th of July, then another one this past Friday. Uh, why is this so significant? 
Well, uh, you know, Pat, the biggest thing about this is that it actually had a reentry vehicle on this one. Uh, this one actually, when it would hit the atmosphere, and it was the exact size and shape that a nuclear warhead would be on the end of that rocket. So uh, that is what has uh, members of the uh, Pentagon forces uh, so concerned right now. And also, it did travel a lot further, uh, some 2,300 miles high and about uh, 206, or excuse me, 621 miles. Uh, in the distance. So if you flatten the trajectory, as you mentioned, that could hit cities such as Los Angeles, Denver, and even Chicago. Well, all right. Uh, what, I mentioned some of the options that are being talked about. The Wall Street Journal had an op-ed about uh, what they could do, but wh what are the people you're talking to, what are they considering as a uh, response to this? Well, you know, so many people said a preemptive strike should have taken place like 20 years ago uh, when it was early stages in the nuclear uh, nuclear development. But, uh, you know, I did attend a meeting over at uh, the National Press Office where the uh, general, U.S. general of the uh, chief of staff, Mark uh, Milley, actually said that, yes, we are ready, and if we do take a preemptive strike, it would be deadly and catastrophic. So, uh, you know, they're, look, they're also looking at cybersecurity as well, you know, hitting them, hitting them with some sort of cyber uh, cyber attack or something like that to be able to knock them out. If anything, what we are going to do is more sanctions with China to uh, try and bring, uh, to try and kind of choke them out, because that is what they actually, uh, they rely so much on China for their, for the export to be able to come into the country and keep them s uh, surviving there, because uh, so much money is now going to this military and missile development in North Korea. Well, Eric, you know, um there's a vast uh, battery of artillery uh, up to the north of Seoul. Right. And uh, I don't know whether uh, we could uh, do a strike on every one of them, whether we could knock that out. If we start some kind of a war, the thought would that Seoul would be uh, decimated. Uh, have you got any, has anybody indicated what could be done with that? We, we have enough Tomahawk missile, missiles maybe to target each one of those artillery pieces? That's the thing right now is that he has uh, he has so many artillery pieces all throughout the country and uh, so many of them are pointed to Seoul. So uh, as the general mentioned, uh, it would be catastrophic and deadly not only for them but also on our side. And you know if you think about it, if we start moving out our military troops uh, that we have there in Seoul, that would actually be a tip off for North Korea. So uh, so you know it's right now it's it's very very. Uh, 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 Tense, intense situation. Even the general said that th that is North Korea is the country that keeps them up at night. Yeah. Eric, thank you very much. Eric Gonzalez, our Defense Department analyst, and we appreciate that. Uh, well, he, if I if there's ever a time to pray for our president, it's now because you know Russia has an arsenal of nuclear weapons that is second only to ours, and that they could destroy America. I mean, literally annihilate America just as we could annihilate them. And so we're in a standoff on that, but you never know. But <clears throat> North Korea acts like they have got nothing to lose, so why not go ahead and, and bang away? And then you've got Iran over there with their own nuclear program and missile program that is threatening Israel over and over again. They say they want to wipe Israel off the map. So that's going on, and now if they have uh, guided missiles, you know, if, if the if the current uh, Scud missiles, when I, I was over there in that war, and they were throwing missiles at Israel from North Korea, and they kept missing. They didn't hit the targets. Uh, I, I went up and down there, and they just weren't hitting the target. But if they have these guided missiles that apparently the North Koreans have developed, and they put them in a, to the old-fashioned Scud missiles, which there are plenty of around, and they start aiming at Israel, they can devastate that country very quickly. So now we've got Israel in the crosshairs. We've got the uh, um, United States, actually, in the crosshairs. It's, it, it's a very scary world when these huge nuclear weapons are in the hands of madmen. That's why we really need prayer as never before. Terry. Well, still ahead, something old becomes new on Capitol Hill. Has this been done before in a, in a cabinet I, I don't formally? think there's been a cabinet Bible study in America in at least 100 years. And these guys are faithful, available, and teachable, and they're at Bible study every week they're in town. We'll take you behind the scenes of the cabinet Bible study coming up later.
and welcome back to the 700 Club. Heightened security at airports across Australia after authorities disrupted an Islamic-inspired plot to bring down an airliner this weekend. Four men are in custody in what the prime minister called a legitimate and credible attempt to bring down an aircraft. The men, all Lebanese Australians, have not been charged. Australian newspapers report the plot involved an explosive device that would emit toxic gas to disable or kill everyone on board. The bomb was designed to be concealed inside ordinary kitchen equipment. Well, a religious awakening is underway at the White House. Some of the most powerful people in America are gathering weekly to learn more about God's word. White House correspondent Jennifer Wishon has this exclusive look at the Trump cabinet Bible study that's making history. It's been called the most evangelical cabinet in history. Men and women who don't mince words when it comes to where they stand on God and the Bible. These are godly individuals that uh, God has risen to a position of prominence in our culture. All handpicked by President Donald Trump and Vice President Mike Pence. I don't think Donald Trump's figured out that he chained himself to the Apostle Paul. Ralph Drollinger is a former NBA playing giant of a man with an even bigger calling. He founded Capital Ministries with the idea that if you change the hearts of lawmakers, then their Christian worldview will guide them to make good policies. He started Bible studies in 40 state capitals, teaches weekly studies in the U.S. House and Senate, and now leads about a dozen members of President Trump's cabinet in weekly studies of the Bible. Health Secretary Tom Price, Energy Secretary Rick Perry, Education Secretary Betsy DeVos, and CIA Director Mike Pompeo are just a few of the regulars. It's the best Bible study I've ever taught in my life. They are so teachable, they're so noble, they're so learned. Has this been done before in a, in a cabinet I, I don't formally? think there's been a cabinet Bible study in America in at least 100 years. America's top cop, Attorney General Jeff Sessions, also attends. Like Jeff Sessions, he'll go out the same day I teach him something, I'll see him do it on camera. And I just think, man, these guys are faithful, available, and teachable, and they're at Bible study every week they're in town. President Trump is invited to attend the Bible studies, too. Each week, he receives a copy of Drollinger's teachings, and when he can, Vice President Mike Pence will join the study. In Pence, Drollinger sees similarities to Joseph, Mordecai, and Daniel from the Bible, all men who rose to the number two position in governments at different times in history. Mike Pence has respect for the office. He dresses right, like it says Joseph, you know, cleaned himself up before he went to stand before the Pharaoh. He had, Mike Pence has uh, uncompromising biblical tenacity and yet a loving tone about him that's not just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And then fourthly, he brings real value to the head of the nation. Like others, Drollinger often compares President Trump to biblical strongman Samson. I just praise God for them, and I praise God for Mike Pence, who I think, with Donald Trump, chose great people to lead our nation. Jennifer Wishon, CBN News, the White House. Pat, this is so encouraging, isn't it? It's absolutely wonderful. We have never had a, a, an administration like this in my memory. There's nothing that I've ever seen that's even close to this. And the initiatives that Trump is bringing about are startling. But boy, the, the attack against him is, is yeah. it's spiritual. That's why people need to pray for him. I, I don't care you know, about your politics, but I tell you, in terms of what can happen good for the nation, he's, he's at the center of it and doing a fantastic job. Terry? It is very encouraging. Well, up next, a wife and mother who suffered constant pain. I found myself just wanting to get through the day instead of um, enjoying my time with my children and just enjoying motherhood. You know, I just want to be made whole and, and I want to enjoy life and enjoy my family. See how she was supernaturally healed in an instant after 20 years of suffering.
to listen to our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. For more than 20 years, Sarah Kim suffered from pain and stiffness in her neck. Doctors couldn't provide any relief, and Sarah became more and more despondent. But then, one evening, she was totally healed in an instant. It was just a tightness on the left side of my neck, and, you know, it would give me tension headaches. Sarah Kim was in high school when she started experiencing dull pain in her neck and occasional headaches. Initially, it was maybe once every one or two weeks I would have a headache, but that tightness was always there. I don't really know what the source was, but I just remember always having it. Doctors couldn't find a cause, and the pain continued to plague Sarah throughout college and into her career. Over-the-counter pain meds and alternative therapies gave some relief, but the pain and tightness always came back. I thought that this was something that um, I would just have to deal with because I've had it for so many years and there's really no treatment for it. Sarah came to accept the pain as a part of life. That is until she married and had two children. I found myself just wanting to get through the day instead of um, enjoying my time with my children and just enjoying motherhood. It was exhausting. I just didn't have enough energy for everyone. I would ask God, I'd say, God, you know, I just, you know, want you to take away this neck pain and, you know, I just want to be made whole and, you know, I want to enjoy life and enjoy my family. At one point, her therapist gave her neck exercises to work out the stiffness. While doing them one morning in 2015, I must have pulled too hard, because when I pulled my neck this way, I heard a and there was this sharp pain, and I'd never had sharp pain before. It was always a dull, achy pain. I got out of bed, and when I got up to stand up, I felt crooked. I felt like my neck was off to one side, and I couldn't like fully straighten up. For two more years, she dealt with what was now a constant pain. I remember praying and saying, God, you know, I wish you would just take this neck pain away. Will you heal this? Will, will I ever be healed of this? Then one evening in April 2017, she was watching the 700 Club when Gordon and Terry started praying. And so now, in an act of faith, we lay hands on that area of the body that needs healing. And we say... And so I put my hand, my left hand on my neck like this. And the first thing he said was, There's someone you were laying your left hand on the back of your neck and down into your spine and, and shoulder, and you just felt all of that leave. It's like everything came into alignment. That neck pain is gone forever. It's never going to come back. That spine's going to be in perfect alignment. Just receive it now in Jesus' name. As so I said, God, I'm, I'm just going to accept this, and I want this healing. So at that moment, I turned my head to the right and the left, and for the first time, there was no pain. I stood up and felt straight, like, like I felt like my neck and spine were back in alignment. All I could say was, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, that you love me this much, that you would heal me. The next morning, she woke up pain-free for the first time in over 20 years. My neck and shoulders felt relaxed. I felt, you know, like my body had been straightened. And um, yeah, I just felt like a, a new person. Sarah is especially thankful that she can finally enjoy life and her family like she always wanted to do. God does provide, you know, supernaturally. He does heal. That the source of love, joy, and peace really only come from knowing Jesus and, you know, I just really trust that God will, he'll take care of everything that I don't need to worry. And he'll take care of everything for you to trust him with that. 20 years of pain gone in an instant. God is amazing. We want to pray for you today. We know there are many of you who are struggling with issues in your life, whether it's pain or financial or relationship, business-wise, whatever it might be. 
Let's agree together. God says where two or more are gathered in the name of Jesus, there he is in the midst of them. He hears your cry. We want to share some uh, yeah. stories with you of other people go, who've been strengthened. Go, go, this is Gary. Yeah. This is amazing. He's from Chatsworth, Georgia. He had an aneurysm rupture in his brain. The bleeding endangered his life, leading to many prayers on his behalf. His family made a call to the 700 Club's prayer line. God responded, and to his doctor's amazement, the bleeding stopped. It has not returned. Not. That's a miracle. Well, this is kind of the same thing. Uh, Sylvia, who lives in Oakville, Ontario, that's in Canada, had been calling our prayer center for healing. She had a, a two-and-a-half-year-old daughter mm. had stage four cancer, two-and-a-half years old, and her daughter has now been miraculously healed. Wow. Prayer in our counseling center, so God's good. Now listen, folks, you say, well, these people have gotten this, but they must be special. You're special. We're all special to God, and God is no respecter of persons. So he wants to heal you. He wants to touch you. And, you know, the John, the apostle, was writing, I, I pray that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. And I think that is a prayer for all of us, that you might prosper and be in health. Now, Terry and I are going to join hands together. All things are possible with the Lord we serve. Father, we pray together. We pray for the people in this audience that somebody has a neck and a shoulder pain, just like you saw on the air, and right now God is healing you. Mm. That is completely healed in Jesus' name. Thank Someone you, Lord. Someone else with a hip issue. Your hip actually pops out of joint. It is so unexpected and so painful. God has touched and strengthened and healed that right now, and it's not going to happen again. Somebody, Woman, is it Sylvia, is it whatever, you've got terrible bloating in your abdomen. Mm -hmm. It's just a natural bloating, and, and you've cried out to the Lord for it. And right now, if you just place your hands on your abdomen, that bloating is going away. It will not come back in Jesus' name. Terry. Yes, someone else, you have scoliosis. And it's, you'll know this as you because it's, it's not just in the middle of your back, but it's down low near your tailbone, and it kind of throws your body off a little bit. God's healing that for you right now. You're just going to feel a warmth come over the lower part of your back as he straightens that for you, and you'll walk upright. Um, there's somebody, Charlie, you've got a lesion, and that lesion is being healed right now. It's been an open lesion, and it's healing coming together even as we speak in Jesus' name. Yes, Here. and someone else, you have vision issues. It has something to do with your cornea. Uh, you're wondering whether it's ever going to be right again. Right now, Jesus is correcting that for you. Just lift up your hands and receive it. Your vision is clear. And we pray right now for our nation. We pray for our president, the cabinet, and the people who are uh, in positions of responsibility. Lord, give them godly wisdom that they'll know what to do in this time of crisis that we live in. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And amen. amen. Wherever you are, folks, please give us a call. We're on the air. But we'll be, you know, when the program's over, we're still available 24 hours a day. Uh, it's 1-800-700-7000. Somebody's here who loves you. You want prayer, just call. Somebody's there. We're here for you. Just pick up the phone, call in. Terry? Well, still ahead. At one time, he dreamed of being a professional golfer. Today, he pastors the 25,000-member Dream City Church in Phoenix, Arizona. Luke Barnett joins us live later on today's 700 Club. Welcome back to the 700 Club. Venezuela's President Nicolas Maduro says his country's election Sunday was another victory for the Socialist Party. Maduro had called the country to vote on a constitutional assembly that would allow him to rewrite the Constitution and override Congress. Authorities say 8 million people voted. But opposition leaders say that number was far less. Sunday's election comes after nearly four months of political unrest that's left more than 100 dead and thousands of others injured or arrested. CBN's Orphan's Promise is giving hope and love to children from difficult backgrounds in the heart of Cuvado, Ecuador. 
Orphans promise youth education centers act as areas of refuge amidst some of the city's most dangerous streets. Gangsters and drug dealers bring their children to the Orphans Promise School knowing they will be well cared for. The hope is that by loving children, the doors will open to minister to fathers and mothers and see whole families come to Christ. You can find out more about what CBN is doing around the world by going to cbn.com slash international. Pat and Terry will be back with more right after this. Luke Barnett is a world-class dreamer, but when he was a teenager, he had no real vision for his future after he realized that playing golf for a living just wasn't going to cut it. Luke Barnett is the oldest son of mega pastor Tommy Barnett, but Luke had no desire to follow in his dad's footsteps. He wanted to play golf. Though he traveled around the world playing the sport he loved, Luke felt like he was dying on the inside. In his book, The Dream-Centered Life, Luke shares how he figured out the true course for his future and offers ways we can find direction in our own lives. Please welcome to the 700 Club, Luke Barnett. It's wonderful oh, to have you here. Thank you. It's great to be here. Love your family. Just you. so many wonderful things that God is doing through all of you. But when you were growing up, it wasn't like you looked at your dad, Tommy, and said, oh, I want to be, I want to do what he's doing. And your dad was very wise in how he handled that. Tell us about that. Yeah, he was always um, very insistent that uh, we not pursue ministry unless we really felt the call of God upon our life. He knew that ministry was difficult and, and challenging. And if you were not called, yeah. it probably wasn't going to work. And so he would always say, you know, make sure that you really feel this is what God wants you to do. And so mm -hmm. for many years, I didn't feel like that was what yeah. God wanted me to do. In fact, you had a passion for golf. I did. And you thought that was going to be your life dream. Yeah, I played on, you know, the mini tours in, in Arizona yeah. and, and quickly learned that that was a, a tough path, you know, yes. lots of competition. And uh, one day my dad said to me, you know, if someone asked you to, to uh, go speak at their church, I think you ought to just accept the invitation just to see if you like it or see if God might <laughs> use you that way. I said, sure, you know, I, I knew that God wasn't going to open a door. You're on the golf course. Yeah, what I'm not thinking that. And two weeks later, a gentleman from Goodyear, Arizona called. My dad didn't even know this man and said, it's a funny thing, I just felt like you should come speak to our church. So I, I accused my dad right away and said, you set <laughs> you this set whole thing up, up you know. <laughs> And uh, he didn't know the man. Really? But he said, you said you would if God wow. opened a door. So what did you do? And I went and I memorized one of my dad's sermons. <laughs> you did what anybody did. I do. stumbled and <laughs> stammered through the thing. Uh, but when I got to the invitation, yeah. you know, uh, that was natural. Yes. And uh, I really felt God's you know, power in my life. And I gave the invitation to receive Christ. And a beautiful African-American lady came forward and received the Lord. And that moment changed my life. Wow. And I knew at that moment that was God's calling for my life. Yeah. You know, I, I think Many people strive to know God's calling for their mm -hmm. for their lives, Luke. I, I meet a lot of people who are just doing a job. Yeah. You know, they're they're not passionate about what they do. They're not excited about it. And they kind of say, well, some people find it, some people don't. But you believe that we can really pursue our God-given destiny mm -hmm. and passion. Where does one begin? Well, I believe that God has a, a dream, a God-sized dream for every mm -hmm. human life. I really believe that. And, you know, I think a lot of people, they, they live their life on a secondhand revelation from yeah. God. And uh, they, they live on their parents' religion. Yes. For many years, I built, I pastored two churches before uh, moving to Phoenix, Arizona. And I operated on a secondhand revelation. I did what mom and dad did when they built uh -huh. the church. This is the way you do it. And God yeah. blessed it. God mm -hmm. blessed his obedience. And it was an addition. But I always wonder why there wasn't that supernatural surge that just yeah. pushed the church forward. And so when I um, took the baton from my dad, literally a gold baton in Phoenix, when he passed it over from Dr. Bill Bright, it said for, f for training 5 million workers. Wow. That's kind of intimidating receiving that baton. You know, I like I don't, I don't so. want to touch that baton. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, that moment, um, I went through a season of depression or oppression. And I knew it was because I didn't have a God-sized dream for, for that church. And this, that church has always been, always been led by a dreamer, my dad. <laughs> And so I did the only thing I knew how to do. I went to a little place on the side of the mountain 
that I carved out for my dad 20 years earlier, working construction for the church. Wow. And uh, he would climb up every day at the side of the mountain and he would pace back and forth in this little area that I carved out with a bobcat. We put a safe in the side of the mountain where he kept his Bible. And every day he would walk up there with a cup of coffee and his Bible and a newspaper and pray and read the paper and look over the city and dream for the future mm -hmm. of the church. So I said, well, I, we made that area 20 years earlier. I went up there for 40 days, I prayed and I fasted, and God downloaded His dream for the future of our church. Wow. And I found out at that moment, that was in 2013, that in 2023, our church would be 100 years old. And so God gave us the dream of a century, what our church would look like at the year of 100, wow. five things, and all five of those things, three and a half years later, are coming to pass. We went from one campus to four campuses in just three and a half years. And this is what I always tell people about the God-sized dream. Um, you can live your life on a second-hand revelation, but when you get the first-hand revelation, it's a lot more fun mm -hmm. and a lot more adventurous and because you see God off. doing it. Yes. Because it's, it's God's responsibility to perform what He's shown you. Yeah, that's exactly right. How did that change for you? How were you able to embrace that? And even as these things began to happen, I, I'm sure you feel both a sense of gratitude and awe, and at the same time, oh my goodness, more responsibility. Yeah. Well, that was a decision I had to make coming down from the mountain, because the church was already large, 10,000 people, you know, at the one campus. Yes. So now I had these five massive dreams that God had placed in my heart, and I had a decision. Am I going to share that with the people, or am I going to coast for the next 20 years of my life and just enjoy the beautiful church and enjoy playing golf and yeah. just, you know... Uh, Take it easy. Yeah. <laughs> and so, but I just sense the Holy Spirit saying to me that secret faith is shallow faith. Yeah. And so I stood up and I shared the vision. And the moment I did, it just it took started. off. It started. Yeah. People started mobilizing. We took our first miracle offering about uh, two months later, and uh, the people gave $1.7 million in one weekend. That had to be affirming. And that was it, because <laughs> we wanted to build, you know? Yes. And uh, so the, the ball was rolling forward. and. Uh, people started coming to us and uh, giving us their campuses, you know, that they've worked for giving decades. Giving them? Yes. If, I mean, that's crazy. If, if we were to go out and try to start a campus, it would take us 30 years to build the campuses yes. that they're giving us, and God is multiplying it. And so we tell people now yeah. that our God-sized dream in the next 20 years is to see Arizona become known as a Christian state. Wow. Because, you know, states are known for stuff. Absolutely. Utah is known as a Mormon state. Sure, and Michigan. You know, <laughs> yeah. And California is known for entertainment. Yes. New York is known for commerce yes. and Texas for oil and millionaires. Why can't there be one state in America that's just known for those people who love Jesus? And so that's our dream. We want to plant a dream city church in every city of Arizona. Well, and one of the things you share in your book, The Dream-Centered Life, is that this isn't just for Luke Barnett and his church or even the state right. of Arizona. It's for all of us. That's right. So where do we begin? It seems like prayer was so mm. essential to that's the right. leaping off point for you. Yeah, this book is not for just for ministers not for Christians, it's for anyone who, you yeah. know, wants to pursue God's dream for their life. For me, I think it came down to, do I want God's dream for my life more than I want food? Yes. And yes. so I went on a 40-day mm -hmm. Daniel fast, right? Nothing but twigs and bird seed <laughs> and leaves, you know, for 40 <laughs> days. But um, I wanted to feel that, that hunger yes. of, of going after God's dream. I don't, I don't believe that God will give His God-sized dream to people who um, just kind of want it. Are lukewarm. Yeah, right. I think that you have yeah. to really want um, yeah. God's plan for your life more than you want, you know, something that's essential to your daily needs, like even like food. And so that's where I began. Yeah. And I think that God saw that, that hunger inside the heart. Yeah. It was real. Yeah. It was real. And you address in here characteristics of a dreamer, the habits of a dreamer. I mean, we, we have just skimmed the surface. Luke Barnett's book is called The Dream-Centered Life. It's going to be re released in a couple of weeks. August 15th is the date you'll be able to find it. If you'd like to know how to pre-order a copy, go to CBN.com. And you can also see more of Luke in a socially, social exclusive interview on our Facebook page. So take a look at that. And here is heart. To watch that, go to Facebook.com com slash 700 club wonderful word you thank bring you to all so of us much. thank you Luke. Thank you, god Jerry. bless you this is for many many people well coming up we've got your email a viewer wants to know can i baptize my grandchildren stay tuned pat's going to answer that grandpa pat's going to answer that after this <laughs> Nearly 
Nearly two million of Kenya's children are orphans, like 12-year-old Edmund. When we met him, Edmund was hitching rides on buses, sleeping on the streets, and eating garbage from the dump. Edmund always dreamed of becoming a doctor, but when his parents died, the 12-year-old was sent to work. I went to town to sweep houses and shops and to collect scrap metal to sell. I gave the money to my grandmother. Edmund was always hungry and no one looked after him. My life was so hard I couldn't stand it anymore. I saw a bus coming so I snuck on it and hid under a chair. He slept on the streets and ate garbage from the dump with the other homeless children. Then he saw some kids who looked happy. The children were from an orphanage supported by CBN's Orphan's Promise. When we noticed him, we asked him to stay and share the food we had. Here at the orphanage, more than 50 children have been rescued from wars and poverty. We love them all. So we teach them about God and instill Christian values in their hearts. We make sure they do well in school so they can be independent one day and have a good quality of life. Edmund is just happy to have a home. I feel good here because I have food to eat, water to drink and clothes to wear. Before I came to this home, I did not know who Jesus was, but I met him here. Orphan's Promise has seven projects just in Kenya alone. And uh, the things that are being done in these children's hearts and with their lives are so compelling. I, I want to say thank you. They are healed from the kind of wound woundedness that Edmund experienced just in grief and the loss of his parents being alone. But what I see, I just got back from Kenya, and what I see is that the love of Jesus is setting these children free from the things that would have directed their lives negatively. They are alive. They are well. We talked with Luke about dreaming. They're dreaming. They're dreaming big. They want to be doctors and lawyers and political science majors. And Pat, I know mm. you want to start a, um, what were you talking to me about, a track team at oh, Regina? I think I've got some runners yeah, for yeah. you. <laughs> <laughs> they win the two of us. Yes. They're good. Yeah. So when you join the 700 Club, uh, folks, I want you to know you support all of this work around the world. And uh, one of the things we want to do to say thank you for caring about children who are alone and without love and hope and direction. Join the 700 Club at 65 cents a day, $20 a month. And when you do, we thank you by sending you this amazing DVD, Miracles. You want to talk about a faith builder? This is it. And it's our gift to you when you call. Our number's toll free. It's 1-800-700-7000. So easy to remember. But call now because you really, really can change lives without ever leaving the comfort of your living room. We need you to help us do that. So thank you. Pat? What an exciting trip, by the way. It's really... Oh, my goodness. Yeah. You know, I want to tell you a quick story. We had a pastor, the, one of the, the places that we support, who was told that there were some orphans out in a, an area outside yeah. of a village. He went to find them, and in the early morning, didn't see anything but a field that looked like it had been plowed and furrowed, mm -hmm. ready to plant. Mm -hmm. And he was ready to turn around and leave when all of a sudden... The furrow, it was not furrows, they were children. They started to stand up. Oh no. In this field just covered with dirt. Oh. No place to belong, yeah. no food, nothing to eat. But today those kids are in a CBN oh. Orphan's oh. Promise sponsored home. They're eating, they're being fed, they're watching Superbook, they're learning. They recited scripture for us while we were there. Praise they God. love Jesus and they know he set them free. So That's it's pretty amazing. And people in Kenya love you, oh, by the way. So they watch. Absolutely. Okay, well, I've got some questions Go for you. Are you ready? Got a few minutes. This is a viewer, viewer who says, I am the matriarch of my little family. I'm born again. Jesus is my Lord. Can I baptize my grandchildren? Three of them have not yet been baptized, ages 17, 13, and 10. Well, you know, uh, in the Bible, I don't know anything in the Bible that says there has to be some, quote, ordained minister to baptize people. Um, I really don't. I, I just think uh, you could be baptized. And so if you're the matriarch of the family and want to baptize the children, I see nothing in the world wrong with it. The thing that I'm concerned about before I would baptize somebody is to make sure they know the Lord and that they're being buried with him 
uh, in baptism and raised in newness of life, and they understand what they're doing. It isn't just putting water over them. Uh, so, I mean, it's it's a new experience. And but by all means, go for it. Okay, this is Trent Pat, who says, Can God heal my relationship with my brother? I'm 13 years old. He's 22. We've always had a good relationship until recently when we got into a huge fight. I'll admit that I was wrong, but he told me never to talk to him or come to him for anything again. I'm agnostic, but I watch your show every night at 11 p.m. I even prayed to the Lord Jesus that he would repair our relationship. I'm so broken because I need my brother for guidance. Can I keep thinking about, I keep thinking about converting to Christianity. It would mean so much if you answered this. All right, first of all, um, you know, young people say things that they don't really mean. They, they use extreme terms that they don't really mean. Your brother loves you, and he wants you to love him and you to love, uh, to, to be together because you're very special to him. So I think if you go to him and say, please forgive me, I'm sorry what I said was wrong, would you please forgive me? And I think the answer, he'll say yes, and then hug each other and get on with life. But I know how important it is, but don't, don't hold back. and. Don't wait for him to do something. You, you, you take the initiative and say, look, I'm sorry. I did wrong. I spoke something that was wrong. But those hurtful words that young people say, they, they don't mean them. Uh, they speak in the heat of the moment. And then, you know, I wish you were dead. I'd like to kill you or something. They don't mean all that. So just your mother, your brother loves you. He wants to get together with you. All right. He says also he keeps thinking about converting to Christianity. Well, That'd be a great step. He certainly accept. should do that because you'll know the love of God, which is more important mm -hmm. than anything. All right. Okay, this is Melissa who says, should I continue to stay with my husband since he has neglected me for years? He has slept on the living room chair for a total of nine to 10 months. He's made his sister the center of his whole world. Every year for our anniversary, which is also his birthday, his family has asked him to go out with them, but not one time have they acknowledged it was our anniversary. This has been going on since 2011. Only this year, my husband has asked me to go out for our anniversary. I told him, no, I'm not ready for that because he never acknowledged our anniversary before. It was out of convenience for him this year because his sister wanted to have her new house painted. I'm so sick of being nothing in his life. I believe that I need to leave him and maybe then he might realize that he lost a good person. Um, I don't know how to answer that. I really don't. Uh, uh, it's a tragedy. Uh, you might consider uh, a trial separation, but God is on the side of bringing together and restoring, not breaking up. And so I don't want to counsel you in a thing like that to break up. Uh, but, you know, he doesn't remember your anniversary, uh, doesn't want to go have a party with you. I mean, big deal. I wouldn't make a lot of that. I really wouldn't. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, some people, uh, anniversaries are not as important as others. And he wants to look after his sister. I, I you know, that's an interpersonal thing, but the biggest thing is he's your husband and you want to do everything to fight for your marriage, okay? Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from the Psalms. As far as the East is from the West, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. Well, that's all the time we've got. For Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. Thanks so much for being with us. We've got an exciting story about a little island off the coast of Virginia.